They start the. No countdown anymore, right, Dick? No, yeah, we're oh, we're good. We're good. All right then. Welcome, everybody. Good evening. Uh, this is the October 19, 2020, regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting. Uh, before we begin, if you could all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Uh, roll call. Mr. Roush. Yep. President McFarland. Here. Vice President Singer. Here. Secretary Roush is here. Treasurer Fidel. Here. Member Baker. Here. Member Blazy. Here. Member Lauterbach. Here. All seven are present. All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, jumping right into the consent agenda, we have item 2.1, the approval of the minutes from September 21 of 2020, the regular meeting. We also have item 2.2, uh, a number of staff members that have announced their resignation on the effective dates listed. Item 2.3 is approval of the payment of the school system's bills for the months of July and August, as listed in the check registers prepared by Mr. Holderby. I'm sorry, Ms. Holderby, in the total amount of $16,186,021. Uh, the distribution of the obligations is included in the documentation that was uh, attached to the board books. Uh, 2.4 is approval to pay uh, legal bills in the amount of $1,708.50. We'll make a motion to approve 2.1 through 2.4 of the consent agenda. Support. Motion by Phil, support by Mary. Any discussion? I have some discussion. Um, we can either move 2.3 or we could discuss it right now. It doesn't matter to me at all. I'm totally open to do either one, whichever works better uh, for us. Why don't we just discuss it then? Okay. A um, handful of months in a row, we've got the executive summary report from Barton Mallow that's as part of 2.3. And 2.3 is the approval of payment of the school system's bills for the months of July and August of everything that Scott just read. And I don't think it goes there. I, I voiced my opinion before, and I feel very strongly that it is not part of the consent agenda and or approval of the payment of the school system's bills. So that is my opinion, and that's why I'm going to vote no on the consent agenda. So you're not, you're not voting to approve its backup documentation to the bills that you, that you had once requested, it, and so we were only putting it there as that documentation, like there's a lot of documentation this month because of the July and August and plus the open POs that we write at the beginning of the school year in there. Yep. The Barton Mallow executive summaries just there as the documentation. That was the only intent to ever put it there. So I'm not sure where else we would put it besides with the bills and consent agenda as its backup documentation. It could be an FFO as for information only because the rest of those things are directly relative to the bills of the district that are, are ongoing July and August. Um, the graphs, the dashboard, the general fund revenue by source, object, and function. And I don't have a problem with, with including the executive summary report. I do want that as part of our minutes, but I think it should be moved to FFO because it's simply for information and FFO is really the leader of the intricacies of the bond. Okay, uh, I guess if you want to make a motion to do that, you can. Um, and we can take it to FFO to the assessment, but I, it, it is, you do pay the bills there. Right. So the documentation would be in a different spot, and I don't have a problem with it. I, I would prefer just to keep it together. Full board I think, think that's the way we've been doing it, so... Um, I guess your objection is noted, uh, and if you vote no, you vote no. Okay. Um, all right. Any other discussion? Okay. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. 6-1. Motion carries. Next up, uh, presentations to the board. Mike, 3.1, Shining Stars. Yes, we have two this month. Um, so, unlike last month, we'll cover our two. Our first one is the 
first one um, was kind of an exceptional case. So Brent Doe is our first shining star. Brent has been part of MPS for 28 years. He joined the staff in 1992 as a sixth grade teacher at Chippewasee Elementary. In 97, he moved to Central Middle School to continue his work with sixth graders. In 2004, he moved to fifth grade classroom at Siebert Elementary. And in 2010, he began teaching at Jefferson, um, a teacher at Jefferson Husky. Brent earned his Bachelor's of Science degree from Ball State University in elementary education and his Master of Arts degree in administration from Central Michigan University. Mr. Doty was nominated by an MPS parent and several Jefferson colleagues. Among their comments were the following. Thanks to his quick response recently, he started CPR when my son had a cardiac arrest during a break. The following morning, he followed up with my daughter to make sure both kids were doing okay. Recently, a Jefferson student had a medical emergency that required immediate reaction. Without hesitation, Brent took the responsibility of literally saving the young man's life. If it were not for his quick response and unwavering commitment to ensuring this young man was safe, the outcomes would have been different. While this event was truly heroic, Brent goes above and beyond daily. I can honestly say that Brent generally cares about all students and his <coughs> colleagues. Students come back looking for Mr. Doty because they know they belong when they are around him. His smile, positive energy, and acceptance of everyone is truly appreciated. He loves being a Husky. Brent is a dedicated team player. Whenever asked to help in any area, his response is always, whatever you need, no problem. And I am happy to help. And he really is. It is without reservation that I nominate Brent Doley for the MPS Shining Star. Congratulations, Brent. Um, they're not here tonight, but being recognized for yeah. Our second shining star is Lawrence Henry. Lawrence joined the MPS team in 2015 as a member of the MPS grounds team. Our grounds crew takes care of our lawn, snow removal for MPS buildings, the heavy lifting when it comes to deliveries across the district, and much more. Just this past June, Lawrence was promoted to the position of handyman or handy person at Plymouth Elementary. He now handles custodial, sanitization, sidewalk, snow removal, and assisting when something isn't working properly in the building. Lawrence received many Shining Star nominations from his colleagues at Plymouth Elementary recently. Here are just a few of their comments. Lawrence has been a rock star all summer and through the beginning of the school year for all teachers at Plymouth. <clears throat> He's always friendly and positive and has an elbow bump for everyone he meets. He takes the time to appropriately interact with students and staff and always has a friendly hello for everyone each morning. He is a worker. I never see him just sitting down. He has handled all of his tasks optimistically and willingly. He takes pride in his job. He is great with communication and reaches out to see if anyone needs anything. Mr. Henry is also taking the time to get to know the students and interact with them when he sees them in the hall. His willingness to help in any situation is so appreciated by the staff. Lawrence embraced the COVID protocols and helped the building to run so smoothly from the get-go. Because of Lawrence's pride in his job and his get-it-done philosophy, Plymouth staff is better able to focus on children and, and really appreciate his commitment. Congratulations, Lawrence. <clears throat> All right. Uh, thank you, Mike. Yep. Uh, next up, we have item 3.2. This is our Jefferson Middle School Water Conservation Presentation at International Space Station Research and Development Conference. So Christine Brillhart and Tila should be online. No. No. Tila's going like this. No, no. not Tila, okay. No, Tila, no. So um, I had some students a will they be able to be unmuted for after our presentation? Okay, thanks. So good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for this opportunity to share our project with all of you. Our, next, we would like to play our narrated presentation that we used at the ISS Research and Development Conference in September. Afterwards, we'd be happy to answer any questions or comments you had. So this presentation, we had to narrate because we couldn't, uh, we had to do it virtually. 
and then they um, asked us to just narrate it because we couldn't make the exact time. So I'm just going to share that with you. Um, here we go.
flash water, plants will not be able to store the water in their leaves and must use the water to grow and for photosynthesis. Therefore, the result of this experiment provides a step further in, on water conservation, on crop cultivation, and thus aids scientists at NASA Kennedy Space Center to find suitable crops to add fresh food to astronauts' diets. Thank you for your time. Any questions? So that's our presentation, and we have our mentor and uh, the four ladies here that helped work on it. Uh, if you have any questions, I, Mary Fridell, I hope you're all warm and fuzzy over that. <laughs> I'd love to ask the young lady, the students and young ladies, about um, the experience and what they got out of presenting to NASA and the International Space Station. Um, Jessica, would you like to answer that? Um, yes, I would. So um, this presentation um, was really important to us because we got to really uh, learn about the science of plants and how water um, reduction would impact that. But we also, um, uh, we also learned many pre professional presentation skills and interacting with the uh, NASA professionals and scientists, um, even if it wasn't in person, was really, um, really a great experience for us so that we could um, understand a little bit more how these things worked. And just watching um, the plants grow and, have, and having that experience was also really amazing. Um, I would like to add on to that. So being able to present at NASA was really cool, like Jessica said. But I also think it was um, interesting because this was what you're going to be doing in real life. You're going to be presenting your ideas as a scientist or maybe as a someone who's trying to sell their product or something like that. So I think it's a good real life experience. Yeah, and it was nice to be able to learn how to work with PowerPoints and just record a presentation through that virtually. And adding on to what they said, even um, through the presentation skills we learned, we also learned a lot of like data collection and analysis while we were like watching the plants grow and such because I mean, before this entire experience, I thought, oh, you water a plant, you put it under some sun, and it grows. And yeah, that is what happens. But after like this experience, I know so much more about like how the plant grows, how to like watch it grow, how does the water affect the plant growth. And even just, even not even related to plants, just how to analyze data and apply it to other things. Bravo. Congratulations to yeah. the four of you. So can, um, Christine, can you tell us a little bit about how how we have an opportunity to uh, uh, get into a program like this with NASA? Um, so uh, the mentor, Lisa Tissay, uh, approached me it was with the Techno Huskies robotics team and my science Olympiad about three years ago. And she asked if we could, um, there's a group in Florida called Fairchild uh, Botanical Gardens and they have a grant with NASA to grow, to practice growing um, plants and gathering data so that the astronauts can eventually have some fresh vegetables on the space station. And so, so Science Olympiad, we were doing this as an after school collaboration project. And then now uh, it, it's expanded because uh, two of the main ladies here are at the high school, so they're going to be carrying it on at the high school, and I'm going to continue it here at the middle school. So they have a grant. A lot of Florida schools do this program, and we're the only Michigan school right now. So um, that is growing these plants that we um, know of. And this year we're growing peppers. And so it's, it's kind of neat. So uh, Lisa, to say uh, Margaret's mother, uh, approached us, like I said, it was part of the outreach program with the robotics team. Lisa, did you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. Um, this is originally, we did a, a Minden Farmer's Market outreach at, at the summer, and then kids got inspired by our local Minden Farmers, actually. And uh, this, a, 
a little bit story about this is like um, I was looking for possibility to grow planes on Mars at a time. Robotics teams, a theme is re regarding to um, have humans and robots to be uh, overcome the uh, space travel journey, design a robot to do as such. So uh, it's kind of very interesting, unique experience that I bring it in. Uh, when I contact um, all the nurseries in Michigan and then in the nation, uh, fair trial responded, and that's how we got into uh, this pro wonderful project. Um, and I really appreciate um, Mrs. Bill Hart will be able to provide her uh, science uh, lab for kids to uh, experimenting uh, how to grow plants. And uh, those seeds are actually uh, um, seeded from the International Space Station. So for the first two years, they are growing the seeds from, not from Earth, but uh, it's from the um, outside of Earth in the space. So that's why we call it as a space plants. And then this year, because of COVID, uh, they decided to think creatively, uh, GB, uh, going beyond us project sponsored by NASA, uh, decided to uh, have kids to grow plants at home. So this is uh, a, a very, very first time we have to uh, design um, that notebook, all the material got sent home, and then make sure um, they have communication skills um, to ensure each print is uh, in a good shape. So I think this is a very unique experience for uh, students to um, cultivating them to become a, a future scientist. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm just floored by the uh, professional presentation and the data that was shared and the process used to collect that data. And um, uh, what, a, what a wonderful opportunity for our students. So thank you so much for uh, helping Midland Public Schools bring this to our kids. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else, guys? Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate you presenting tonight. Okay. Um, next up, item 3.3, .3, we have Ann Sheffer and Tila Sherman who are going to talk about the uh, Midland Public Schools Social Emotional Learning Program. And they are online as well. Yep. I think Ann, Ann's going to kick it off, maybe Tilo. Hello, good evening. Right. Um, good evening, my name is Ann Sheffer and I am the MTSS coordinator for the district. In October of 2019, you received some information on social emotional learning and this evening's presentation is intended to be a follow up to that. I'd like to start by talking about MTSS, which stands for Multi-Tiered System of Supports. Grounded in the whole child framework, MTSS requires us to deeply understand how our students are doing academically, socially, and emotionally, so we can deliver the right instruction, intervention, or support at the right time. MTSS is a framework with the intended outcome of improving student achievement and increasing positive behavior and well-being by accurately identifying student needs, proactively addressing those needs, preventing further identification of students needing special education services, and providing research-based instruction within a positive school climate. The Michigan State Department of Education identifies five essential components of MTSS as depicted in this graphic. They include team-based leadership, comprehensive screening and assessment system, selection and implementation of instruction, interventions, and supports, continuous database decision-making, and a tiered delivery system. Social emotional learning is deeply rooted within MTSS as an integral part of education and development. CASEL, which is the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, defines social emotional learning as the process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage emotions, and achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships and make responsible and caring decisions. 
Social emotional learning advances educational equity by establishing learning environments and experiences that feature trusting and collaborative relationships, rigorous and meaningful curriculum and instruction, and ongoing evaluation. Social emotional learning can help address various forms of inequity and empower young people and adults to co-create thriving schools and contribute to safe and healthy communities. The Castle Five core competencies are self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. And this infographic shows how the five social emotional learning competencies are broad and interrelated. We know that social emotional learning is a critical component of the whole child and overall well being. It is hard not to talk about social emotional learning without thinking about the impact of the last seven months. The global pandemic created multiple conditions favorable to trauma development for adults and children alike. All experienced a loss of freedom of choice of where to go, what to do, and people to see. Many were restricted from visiting relatives. Children were unable to play with friends or visit grandparents, which all led to increased isolation and feelings of loneliness. The additional catastrophe of area flooding and the racial injustices within our nation have exacerbated every indicator of preconditions for trauma. All of these factors force us to be mindful of the impact of these experiences, the chronic stress and trauma on the developing learning brain of our students and equally for our adults. We know that social emotional learning helps children survive and cope, but also persevere and thrive in various situations. Trauma intersects in many different ways with culture, history, race, gender, location, and language. Trauma can impact childhood development and behavior, has a far reaching and long lasting impact and affects how youth and families approach services that are designed to help them. Educationally speaking, children who experience trauma are two and a half times more likely to fail a grade in school, score lower on standardized achievement tests. They are more likely to have struggles in receptive and expressive language, suspended and expelled more often, more frequently placed in special education and are at an increased risk of depression, anxiety, and PTSD. It's important to know that children who have experienced trauma can heal, especially within positive and protective relationships. One strategy is to have a trauma-informed lens or approach as we implement social emotional learning. A trauma-informed strategy is a universal strategy, meaning it's appropriate for all students and all staff. Components of being trauma-informed include providing kids safe spaces and environments, approaching kids with empathy and understanding, validating feelings and behavior, and building relationships, and explicitly teaching and supporting student social emotional learning and well-being. The message that we have continued to share since the beginning of COVID is that well-being is our top priority. From the beginning, we have worked to stay connected with students and families and help to ensure that their basic needs were met. From a psychological standpoint, based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the learning part of the brain cannot be activated if basic needs are not met. And as we restructure our continuous improvement process and implement MTSS, we need to identify and address root causes such as trauma to have an impact on our most at-risk children academically. Castle also identifies four focus areas for high quality systemic social emotional learning. In 2018, Central Park partnered with the SCSU RISE program as a means of supporting student behaviors. Recognizing the need for a sustainable model, we have again partnered with Sarah Owens to build our district capacity and expand the work at a universal level. We know that our best intervention and resource are our teachers. We currently have a cohort of 12 teachers representing four elementaries engaging in professional learning with resilience work. Our student support specialists are working alongside Sarah and will not only be facilitating professional learning and development, but will be pushing into classrooms and coaching the participating teachers, as well as guiding them through structured reflection. In addition, we are leveraging our wellness committee to focus on adult well-being. The team met a few weeks ago and we will be meeting again this week. This team will be setting objectives and plans to intentionally focus on our adults. We are also integrating and aligning this work within the PYP framework. Our PYP coordinators and student support specialists met at the beginning of this school year and started the discussion on how we can be more explicit with the teaching of the IB learner profile attributes and approaches to learning since they so closely align with the core five competencies. 
This is also important so that social emotional learning is not perceived as one more thing to do or cover. In fact, it should be at the foundation of our culture and instruction. By developing these skills, we are better prepared to address and strengthen student and adult academic and social emotional behavioral well being. Within our cohort of teachers in the resilience work, there is a mindfulness component in which lessons will be taught to these students, further promoting student social emotional learning and the teaching of emotional regulation. In order to have continuous improvement, we also recognize the need for database decision making. The buildings currently engaged in the resilience work um, completed a school assessment, and this tool allowed the administrator and the team of teachers to report and score themselves based on a number of different indicators. They will be using this information to set objectives for school-wide practices and policies that relate to social emotional learning. Now I'd like to turn it over to Tila Sherman, principal of Jefferson Middle School, and she will be sharing the work that they've been doing at Jefferson. Good evening. My name is Tila Sherman, and I am the proud principal of Jefferson Middle School. When I became a principal last year, I knew I was going to ask teachers to step outside their comfort zone as we continue to discuss student growth, instructional strategies, and develop a continuous improvement plan that would require them to engage in work they had never done before to meet the needs of all students. I also went, to, went into this role fully aware that our profession was losing some of its best at a significant rate. Teacher retention has been a conversation for some time now, and yet the number of teachers staying in the profession past year five is decreasing rapidly. Trying to figure out how to challenge teachers without breaking them or chasing them away from this amazing profession was and continues to be a focus. How do leaders accomplish such a colossal feat? To our assistant principal and I, it was simple. We committed to focus on building and sustaining authentic relationships. Many of us have seen or heard the research that indicates organizations with empathetic leadership and workplace connection leads to a sense of belonging, thus less turnover, happier employees, and an increase in productivity and innovation. Because we believe that teachers truly make the difference in a child's life, we began to focus our professional development with the desire to ensure all staff have the opportunity to build relationships and connections with their colleagues and themselves. During our professional development as a collective team, we began to dig deep into the core principles of restorative practices, the whole child initiative, social emotional learning, the continuous improvement model of high reliability schools, professional learning communities, components of PYP, since that's the programming our students were coming from, equity and inclusion. We asked staff to identify the common theme or uh, foundational component of all of these educational initiatives. 100% of the staff agreed it was building and fostering relationships. We then began to engage in activities and experiences that helped them get ready, get, excuse me, get to really know their colleagues and build trust with each other. We frequently implemented practices that focused on psychological safety and vulnerability. Anyone that truly understands education knows teaching is hard and it requires an incredible amount of energy, passion, and care. As building leaders, we know we cannot neglect to reflect the importance, or excuse me, recognize the importance of teacher, teachers being whole and taking care of themselves is required in order to best serve students. Too often, as passionate professionals, teachers and staff put others' needs in front of their own. While this may, may seem admirable, it is dangerous and it is not healthy nor productive. We know that an adult cannot be fully supportive, effective, and careful if they are not taking care of themselves. As the year progressed, it was obvious we needed to continue this work and, were, and where we needed to invest more time and energy. January is a difficult month, month in education because it is typically the start of the third quarter where there are a few breaks, the increased pressure of standardized assessments begins to wrap up, ramp up and the weather can be quite bleak. <laughs> this is relevant because it is a time when we often start to see teachers experience burnout. Knowing this, our January professional development was focused primarily on teachers' well-being. As a matter of fact, we had teachers pick one out of four things they would do if they had an hour to themselves. 
The options were go for a walk, engage in yoga, read a book that had nothing to do with work, or play kickball. While this may seem fluffy or perhaps unproductive, we believed it accomplished two things. One, it showed teachers we care about them as human beings. And two, it supported the belief that in order for them to care for others, particularly their students, they had to focus on their own self-care. We needed them to be able to bring their best selves to their students in order to be the amazing teachers they are. Once we laid this foundation, we then began to provide learning opportunities around trauma-informed instruction. As Anne has discussed, many, if not most of our students, particularly with the pandemic, are showing up with some level of trauma, validating the need for relationships. Students will struggle to learn from people they do not have a connection with. Creating a culture where deep connections are at the core of everything we do is imperative to our assistant principal and myself. We also understand this is not a one-year commitment. Building and maintaining sustainable relationships must be nurtured and supported every day. Last year, our goal was to create and foster connections among the staff. This year, we will continue to focus and deepen our connections and understanding of and with our students and parents. Like many schools, JMS aligned our continuous improvement plan to the new district vision. Our focus is on our evaluations, our processes, procedures, and even our disciplinary approaches are implemented with the belief that quality, quality relationships matter. While this implementa implementation is still in its infancy, we will continue to meet people where they are and move forward together. As human beings, we are wired for connection. We all want to feel cared for and valued in what we do. Students and teachers more than ever need this, particularly right now. Hmm. Effective factors facilitate healing and resilience, and healing occurs within the context of relationships. Our core objective is to build these protective factors for our students and teachers alike to thrive. So again, just to recap some of the things for this year, all of our elementary teachers have received two hours of trauma and ACEs training prior to the start of the school year. Now that they have all received the same information, we can begin to build a common understanding of this work and its importance. In addition, administrators, counselors, family intervention specialists, and student support specialists attended a trauma training in partnership with the Claire Gladwin RESD, where they learned more about trauma and the impact on anxiety and behaviors as students were returning to school. We received great feedback from this session and are looking into how we can expand on that. We continue to connect this back to the work that's already being done in the classroom, but just being more intentional about it. We're also fortunate to have community partnerships that are offering opportunities to our staff. We have staff attending an eight week session on mindfulness with partners and change and the Midland Area Wellbeing Coalition has also been offering wellbeing workshops. Ultimately, we recognize that this work is ongoing. Prior to COVID, we had already had discussion about the need for universal screening for our students in order to be proactively creating systems and organizing resources for support. But with the return to learn recommendations, it specifically called out mental health screening. So we will be launching our universal screening tool this year called the Student Risk Screening Scale, which is a free, valid, and reliable tool available to Michigan school districts. We intend to build up our universal supports, whether that be resources, tools, or accommodations that can be made available to any student in need. We plan to expand the resilience work into the remaining elementaries, and as part of our continuous improvement process, we will also be incorporating social emotional learning into our K-12 plans to ensure that we are programming for all levels of students. And that is the end of our presentation for this evening. Are there any questions? Yeah, I've got, um, I've got one. This one, uh, I guess I can address it to, to Tila. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how these relationship building, and I don't know which TV I'm talking to, uh, which relation, these relationship building initiatives, how they've affected the delivery of education to the students. Has there been a positive impact and, and how do you kind of measure that? Uh, that's a tricky question to answer as, uh, as we were really starting to ramp up some of this professional development, um, COVID, we, we shut down on March 13th. Uh, I can tell you that it's all perception data 
that we have collected based on the professional development that we did last year. And the majority of the teachers indicated that they felt more of a connection within the building. I can give you one little um, story that started as a heartbreak, but I thought it was a success after we did some training. Um, I was talking to a teacher when I was an assistant principal and I was saying, we were doing an instructional um, conversation around the evaluation. I said, hey, you should really go check out this teacher. They do this well, whatever it was, assessment for student learning, I think. And unfortunately, this teacher who had been in this building for a couple of years said, who is that? And it broke my heart because I thought we are a community. We're a community of learners um, and as educators. And so it, it, um, I was very intentional in putting those teachers in a group the first couple of weeks. So if anything, those teachers now know each other to where that they can uh, they can collaborate and discuss best practice best practices on how to um, uh, share instructional uh, strategies. Um, another component that I think is really well that I think is evident is that um, I ask teachers to talk in their PLCs quite often and uh, a true PLC will roll out their data whether it's from formative assessments from the classroom or they're discussing summative assessment data from MSTEP and now even NWEA and in order to do that teachers have to be very vulnerable uh, because you have to be able to say here I am, here's my life's work. And some may see certain data points um, as a failure instead of a growth point. And so in order to be able to be truly vulnerable and comfortable with sharing that data as more of a growth tool, as opposed to a, um, a condemning component, uh, they have to have strong relationships, real relationships to where uh, they understand and they trust that their colleagues will um, will share and collaborate with them without uh, malice or judgment. Amen. Thank you. Tila and Ann, I came to school today and I was trying to think of what concerned me the most with schools, not only Midland Public, but across the state of Michigan. And it's, it's this social emotional learning, it's like you, it, Focusing on strong relationships will go a long, long way, and focusing on well-being, not only of the students, but starting with our educators as well, and coming from that healthier space. Um, and I agree with you. I, I mean, this is, uh, the pandemic has really caused uh, so many different stresses and traumas, and um, I applaud your efforts and what you're doing, and it couldn't come at a better time. Okay. Thank you both for, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate the information and all the hard work you're doing uh, toward the health of the district as a whole. Um, it is invaluable, and it's great to hear about it from, from our standpoint. So fantastic job, and please keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll move on to item four, request to address the board. Is there anybody in the queue waiting to address the board? Not at this time. Okay, we will move on to uh, item number five, Administrative S uh, Services Study Committee. Uh, Mr. Sherrill. Or you could also use Mr. Blasey, but we had six policies that um, came forward through our administrative review. They were not new policies, they were re revised policies to meet uh, federal and state law changes. Anything okay. the committee would like to add? Nope. Okay, and this is an action item, uh, yes. item 5.1. So I will take a motion to adopt. I move to approve item 5.1, uh, board policy revisions. Support. Motion by Pam, support by John. Any discussion for item 5.1? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes. I'm sorry, opposed? None. Motion carries. Brad, thanks for taking care of those. Well, uh, next up, item six, curriculum instruction and assessment. Uh, this is, do we have minutes? Yes, we do. Okay, Lynn. Alrighty. We met on September 21st. 
And uh, the first topic was extended COVID-19 learning plan. Penny, Penny Miller Nelson and Ann Sheffer presented the extended COVID-19 learning plan with particular focus on the required academic growth goals and two-way interaction reporting. More information will be shared at the September Board of Ed meeting and there will be monthly updates at each subsequent board meeting. Then we talked about the DEI. Dr. Amy Beasley provided a summary of the opening staff professional development session that was focused exclusive, exclusively on diversity, equity, and inclusion. The district vision and proclamation were the foundation for learning around systemic racism, anti-racism, and inclusion. Staff co-created segments of the session that provided practical applications of these concepts. The committee discussed the process for selecting teaching and learning resources and affirmed the need to reconsider the district's approach with the added lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The curriculum team will gather research, best practices, and ideas for further consideration. And uh, we adjourned and we met today, but those meetings will be forth minutes will be forthcoming. All right. Thank you, Lynn. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Uh, next up is item 6.2. This is, I believe, an action item, Mike. Is that right? It is. It's now required. Okay. This is the Midland Public Schools Extended COVID-19 Learning Plan Reconfirmation. Penny. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as we noted at our last board meeting when we shared the initial plan with you, these monthly reconfirmation sessions are a requirement and, as Mike said, for your action. Uh, really, the whole team has collaborated on this template and populating it. This will become just a new normal for us each month. The same uh, essential template will be shared with updated data. Uh, so the first requirement is to reconfirm for you our instructional delivery method. And I'm happy to report that at this time, there have been no modifications to our learning plan as it relates to instructional delivery. I'll remind you that in pre-K, we are offering full face-to-face. -face. You know that in elementary grades K-5, we have the full virtual option with an MPS teacher leading those classrooms, along with the full standard face-to-face -face instruction, along with our uh, very specific health and safety protocols. In middle school and high school, we have three options. We have the full face-to-face -face with the health and safety protocols. We have the full virtual option, some courses MPS teacher-led, some provided through our vendor, Edgenuity. And then, of course, we have the hybrid, and we do have some families choosing a combination of the face-to-face -face and the hybrid. Uh, one of the changes to the COVID learning plan that came through the most recent Public Act 165, which was adopted in October, was to add this additional layer. So this represents the percent of students in these special population categories who are 100% remote and those who are ac accessing learning through either uh, full face-to-face -face or hybrid. And the intent here is simply for us to acknowledge that we have students in these special population categories, students who typically require additional support, and for us to acknowledge that we do have students in a virtual space who may need extra uh, guidance and support. So these are just simply the numbers uh, based on enrollment. You can see that students receiving special education services, we have 28% in full virtual. For our economically disadvantaged students, 33%. And for our English language learners, 48%. We are required to summarize the public comments we receive from families, parents, and guardians. Today uh, at our board meeting, the public comment section was open for that feedback, and as you noticed, we had none. So this represents feedback that we received at the Parent Information Committee meeting, as well as feedback that we've received verbally from families or through the MPS Connect uh, feature that we have on our website. It is a combination of Praise for the work that we're doing. You can see the first note that people really do appreciate the multiple modes of learning. These summary comments also lift up some struggles we had, some challenges we had to overcome in the beginning, uh, particularly with our virtual learning students. 
getting those courses up and running. We had some challenges with our vendor being able to find teachers who were certified and credentialed. We also had some challenges accessing textbooks for some of those online classes. We have since worked through that, but wanted to acknowledge that we did receive feedback from parents that that was a struggle. It has also become clear uh, a key theme is that the virtual is a great option, but it does not replace the quality instruction that is offered when you are in a classroom with our MPS teacher. Oops, I'm going backwards. Give me one second. Nope, I'm not. I think we have a duplicate slide. Hmm. Okay. The last piece, um, which Jeff Jaster will report out on for us, this is our two-way interaction rates. Thanks, Penny. Um, as this chart denotes, uh, two-way interactions are what are recorded now for attendance and for pupil accounting purposes for the school year. And with the approval of the ECOL plan last month, we have to document and provide an update each month of these rates. And so we do have the data from the first three weeks of the school year, but that was not required until after the approval of the plan. So we've captured uh, the, the previous four weeks um, for you tonight. I want to note really quickly, though, that for a student to be counted here and reflected in these percentages, they had to have a two-way interaction with a teacher at least two times per week um, for them to meet the requirement, the criteria. So what we're looking at now is, is a positive attendance recording system versus a passive attendance system that teachers have used previously. So in the past, it was common for teachers to mark a student tardy or absent if they were out sick, <clears throat> excuse me, but now the requirement is the teacher physically has to mark every student present. So with in-person learning, present means they showed up and they're in the classroom with the teacher. In the virtual world, if they've connected to uh, a teacher or to a lesson that's happening virtually, we have some new codes that were created. Positive, uh, or excuse me, present virtual classroom would represent that present mark that the student joined the Google Meet. And then they could also be marked present through participation, through completing an assignment, submitting something that gets graded, and that's pre uh, PVP, present virtual participation. So one of those three codes had to have been assigned to the student at least twice per week for them to show up on this chart. And so you can see the percentages here. It's broken down by all students, those that are 100% remote, and then those that are not 100% percent remote which captures our in-person and our hybrid students you'll notice that the center column uh, the remote students it is slightly a lower percentage average but I think that was to be expected with some of the um, arrangements that we have in place for those students where the frequency of their meetings is not um, at least at the secondary not as often as in the face-to-face -face environment so if a student happens to miss a session it can have a negative impact for the week for that student. So uh, it, it is important that those students really try to make and meet all of those sessions. So um, uh, just briefly, though, uh, the threshold is you have to be above 75%, and we are well above 75% in all of those categories. So any questions about attendance? Yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, so that doesn't mean the 100% remote, it looks like it's about an 85% average. Does that mean 15% of the kids are not participating remotely that are remote students? <clears throat> what it means is they haven't recorded at least two of the interactions. So they may have logged in one time, but then they were sick for the next time that the group okay. met, and so they didn't get the two. Um, when we look at the daily rates, which we are trying to capture those as well, the daily rates are typically, um, as I glance through my chart here, those are typically in the upper 80s into the 90s and on every day so and I would note that with um, you know the past few weeks with some of the increased uh, quarantine numbers I think that did have an impact on some of our students as well so I think in all categories uh, we had seen some dip mm -hmm. in our numbers just a bit thanks for the clarification yep so Jeff what are we doing with the uh, when we know uh, we're at 79% what do we do with that information internally 
Well, it really, it just uh, furthers the point that our e-learning uh, teachers and our elves really need to make every effort to try to reconnect individually with students. Uh, we do see that there are some patterns already of uh, attendance issues emerging for some students. And given that in the past you may go through an attendance protocol where um, you know, there might be some support that happens in the building first, uh, letter home to parents. We're still trying to be creative in doing some of those things if we think there's an issue. Uh, but the main thing in the first intervention really is just to try to get that teacher individual connection with a student. So for example, for the elementary, Friday is not a scheduled day for teachers to meet with students. That's a day where kids can check in if they need things. But we have instructed our elementary teachers, if you've only seen uh, one of your students uh, just one day this week or maybe no days on Friday, they need to be reaching out to all those students directly and to the parents to try to, uh, one, capture some um, attendance for that student for the week, but also to make sure they have the information, they have what they need to find out if things were okay at home and to figure out what they can do. So they're trying to problem solve issues together on those Fridays. For the secondary, um, I think it varies uh, more depending on whether the students are edgenuity or with an MPS teacher in person. So if it's a student who's taken an edgenuity course, the e-learning facilitators have open Google Meet sessions twice a week. So it goes back to um, Mr. McFarland's question. If somebody happens to miss one of those sessions for the week, they only get one mark and so they don't get counted. So it could just be an illness, a doctor's appointment, anything. So it is easy to, to lose a mark in some of these virtual scenarios. And so we try to recapture those on Fridays. And again, e-learning facilitators have been instructed, if you only have one mark for a student, you haven't seen them very often that week, you should try to connect with them on Friday. So that's what we're trying to do with that, that last day of the week. Pam, I would add, got to be careful with percentages, yes. small numbers. All right. So only 33% of our kids are in 100% remote. Right. Small numbers change that percentage pretty quickly. And then as Jeff said, your e your ingenuity courses, they only meet twice a week, and they meet if they miss one. Right, that right. Lowers. I wasn't so be careful. about the ingenuity. When you look at 79%, it's significantly <clears throat> low, not necessarily. So in face-to-face, -face, if you miss, if a student miss more than 10 days, then, you know, you're considered delinquent or, you know, what what are the protocols now for that? Like. So, it remains the same. Jeff's ten of some of those, too. So go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, the, the, the probate court would like us to use the same system for recording absences, for communicating with parents. So there's, there's a multi-step um, process. So the first, as I alluded to, is a phone call home, make sure everything is okay. Do they need anything? Is the family all right? Then there's a letter, typically, that's sent. Uh, this year, because we have some that are virtual and we're not seeing them and having trouble connecting, in a few cases we are asking SROs to visit homes. So we've taken many um, steps uh, before we would actually refer somebody to the probate court. Okay, thanks. The kids that um, are mm -hmm. in quarantine, are they 100% virtual or how are they being handled now? Case by case. Mm -hmm. So... Um, if a student is capable of learning remotely, they may, but some of our students who are quarantined need it to learn in a more traditional way, and so the teachers met that need case by case on the quarantine piece of it. The other one I'll tell you, uh, Pam, is those who fail to engage virtually, we're most likely going to need to force them back to face-to-face, -to -face. and so we will be weighing those decisions um, as we go forward. Okay, thanks. I'll just offer quick as a side note, and Jeff, um, chime in here with clarity. What you're seeing here is how we must report this for this reconfirmation plan, the 75% mm -hmm. threshold of two-way two communication. This is not necessarily mirroring how we report for pupil accounting purposes, so I just ask you to keep those somewhat distinct in your mind okay. and not to extrapolate this to <clears throat> how we record things for pupil accounting. Mm -hmm. So this overall reconfirmation plan, uh, that's it in a nutshell. You'll see these same four slides every month uh, with our updated data. And this will be posted on the transparency page the following day upon your approval. 
I move to approve item 6.2, the Midland Public Schools Extended COVID-19 Learning Plan reconfirmation. Support. Motion by Pam, support by Mary. Any discussion beyond what we've had? Okay, hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None, okay, motion carries. That takes us into finance facilities and operations. 7.1, we have study committee minutes from Mary. Um, we met on October 12th. Uh, it went over, uh, had uh, bids were solicited for district property and liability insurance coverage. Representatives from Arbery, Eider, and SETSIG um, presented to the committee. The committee reviewed the bids, presentation information, and will recommend an award, although that's changed slightly. Um, Mr. Shara and Mr. Bruton discussed the following topics with the committee, the July and August financials. July and August financials were reviewed. Variances from year to year were highlighted and attributed to the COVID-19 matters. Purchase cards and purchase orders were discussed. July and August see a large amount of open purchase orders annually due to the fiscal year startup operations. The state budget update, a summation of the state budget and its impact on MPS was discussed with the group. Initial analysis leads to increased revenue projections over the adopted budget uh, based on the flat foundation allowance and a one-time increase per students. Categoricals also came in higher than anticipated. Some of these gains will be offset by a higher than projected decline in enrollment. A budget amendment is planned for January once, once uh, enrollment figures are audited. Um, we discussed wage adjustment. Feedback was solicited on potential wage adjustments for bus drivers and substitute teachers. Also, the dam failure class action, the retainer language from Powell Miller was uh, reviewed and will be presented to the full board for approval this month. Um, energy bond update, a timeline for the project was discussed. And we also covered under di diversity, equity, and inclusion, the committee provided feedback and posting for a director of DEI. Our next meeting is Monday, November 2nd at 5 p.m. Okay, thanks, Mary. Um, take this off for a second. Next up is item 7.2. This is an action item, and as you guys can all see uh, from the agenda, we were prepared uh, when the agenda was created to um, move forward with SETSEG. Um, however, we, it, the long and short of it is the district has multiple lines of insurance within its policy, and we received a follow-up email from Yider saying, hey, we can, we can sell you particular lines of insurance at a lower rate than what was included in the SETSEG bundle. So what we're going to explore, ask SETSEG if it's even possible, is if we could purchase those lines of insurance from Yider at a cheaper rate while still purchasing the uh, more affordable rates from SETSEG and kind of get a hybrid of the two, potentially saving the district even more money than we would if we had just gone with SETSEG as a whole. Now. Whether that's possible or not, I don't know. Uh, it may totally change SETSEG's rates once we try and break up the package, but I think it's worth exploring. And so with that said, I will make a motion at this time that we table uh, item 7.2 until such time we can get an answer from SETSEG and a little more clarity. Uh, and then we'd have to come back for, I think, a special meeting, Mike, unless I'm yes, wrong. Yes, because our insurance our needs to be renewed. Well, before the Be, because 17. we have a, we have yeah so we have expect to. us to reach out to you in the next week or so to schedule a quick one on it. Uh, we know this much that it will change that sex rate, but we'll we'll find out what that occurs because it, in our belief, but we'll do the due diligence. It, it will probably drive the rate above where you are, it, and that may be so. But so I think we'll, it's it's worth at least looking at. You got so, a local vendor in there, and so we're going to make sure we do all our due diligence, and we'll do that if you want to table that. Absolutely. Uh, so so the motion is out there. Support. I support that. Uh, okay, I made the motion. Support by John. Whoever wants it. <laughs> any any further discussion, questions? I would add, Scott. Set's rate was extremely aggressive. It was, and so you have a, a rate that's 
reduce when we had a high claims year on top of it, and so yeah. that was a big piece of it. And, and, and to be clear, we are not opening this up for any additional bids, any additional vendors, any additional pricing. This is limited to this issue alone, and we should have an answer hopefully within a couple weeks. Okay. But you, you said that we have to have this renewal done by the 18th? What? 17th. 17th of November. Of November? Mm-hmm. Okay, so so you'll you'll call us. Will we have a special meeting to come well, in? Or as we always do for special meetings, we'll we'll send the notice to you, post it out, and probably be the only topic on there unless something arises between there and then. Um, so we're going to need a special meeting because you need that renewal November one, two, three, or something to your insurance company. Okay, can of we choice. do that virtual? We can do that virtual. If you guys would like to do that, we can do that piece of it. With a special meeting that may make it easiest. It's a good question, Pat. Do we have to adopt that new policy that came out today? Um, so, you know, I just read some legal opinion on that, Brad, if you do or you don't. I mean, it's, it's legal to do it, mm -hmm. but certainly you have to go into your bylaws and see if there's a blocker. So I just got that at 3 o'clock from Neola. Mm -hmm. I'll read it over a little bit and take a look. They're suggesting you do. I don't know that we have to. But, okay. Yep. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. We're going to take item 7.2 off the agenda. That moves us to 7.3. Mr. Bruton. Thank you. Um, in September, our FFO committee entertained presentations from two law firms to represent us um, to try and reclaim our losses from the dam failure that happened back um, earlier in the spring. Um, to give you a quick recap of our finances, we lost approximately $250,000 from physical damages, furniture damages, flooring damages over at Dow High, limited to just the media center over in that location. And to date, we anticipate that our revenues from insurance monies, FEMA, generous donations, will come in somewhere around $170,000. That's not confirmed, but it's a pretty good ballpark estimate. And so we are going to try and be seeking reclamation of that difference, the $80,000, but also it gets a bit complicated because we know that there are future losses of revenue due to this as well in terms of lost property values, lost enhancement millage, possible losses of student enrollment, et cetera, et cetera. And so we listened to both of the presentations of the law firm back in FFO, and as a committee, we are recommending that we sign the class action retainer with Powell Miller. And before you, the Powell Miller Agreement um, has all of the specific terms that they described to us in FFO, and we feel comfortable that they will represent us aggressively and that they understand our unique situation as a school district and will give us a good position in trying to reclaim some of those lost funds. So we're seeking your approval tonight to enter that class action retainer with Powell Miller. Thank you, Brian. We'll make a, make a motion to sign on with Powell Miller for the Class action lawsuit item 7.3. Support. Motion by Phil, support by Mary. Any discussion? Yeah, I have one comment. Um, I, I fully support signing the, the agreement. In the second paragraph, though, it gives the law firms complete discretion to determine whether, sorry, I'm going to unmask just for a second, um, whether to pursue them as individual mass tort cases or class actions, and I, I, I would feel more comfortable if we asked them to change that to say that the law firms will determine after consultation with client if the case shall be pursued as, I, mean, I, I think we should have participation in that decision, not leave it exclusively up to the firm. So, if we so could, participation, yes, and then we will try to get that. Clarify the language. And, and exactly. Just, I'll just make you, that minor change to, I'll let to you know, like a Friday letter. Perfect, what we have. Okay, okay. but I, I, I fully support the, okay. the agreement. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, next up, 7.4. Uh, for information only, gifts totaling $7,058. Brian. For gifts tonight, just for information, no action required. Uh, four different gifts. The first is $600 from SK Communications. They continue monthly to support us by giving us hotspot credits, which we appreciate their generosity, very needed during these times. Number two from the Midland Area Community Foundation, $1,500 to support the Midland High English Department. 
The third gift was $858 from the Midland Area Community Foundation to help support some spirit wear over at Midland High. And finally, the fourth is $4,100 from the Seabrook PTO, and that is used to help enhance the teacher budgets for classroom supplies. So we thank all of these generous organizations for their support. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, eight, human resources. Uh, 8.1, study committee minutes. John. Sure. Uh, the HR study committee met on October 8th. Uh, we were given an update on current job openings and recent retirements. Uh, Mr. Brutin uh, presented a proposal for wage increases of unaffiliated groups in order to re remain competitive with the group's specific labor market. Mr. Kowalski informed the board members of a January 2021 reporting requirement. The HR team will work this winter to update staff demographic information in preparation for reporting. Finally, uh, Mr. Kowalski discussed the trend of career fairs being hosted virtually rather than in person for the 2020-2021 school year. The group discussed how to engage community partners to attract underrepresented groups to the Midland area. The HR team will be assessing which MDE-approved teacher participation programs would align with our current DEI initiatives. And our next meeting will be on December 10th. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, next up, item 8.2, Mr. Jaster. Thank you. So in memoriam, the board and staff extend their deepest sympathy to the family of Ms. Dorothy Angus. Passed away September 22nd, 2020. Ms. Angus was an office professional at Mills Elementary, Adams Elementary, and then at Midland High School for 23 years, and she retired from there in 1998. Um, I can jump to 8.3 as well, if that's okay. Uh, let me just interject uh, mm -hmm. first. Jeff, I'm going to... Sure. Say something for Phil's mom. Of course, yeah. On Tuesday, October 13th, Susan Catherine Rausch passed away peacefully at home surrounded by her loved ones following a courageous battle with pancreatic cancer. Sue was born in Bessemer, Michigan on July 1st, 1958 as the only girl in a household of four boys. After high school, she attended Michigan Tech University to study accounting and computer science. While at Tech, she met the love of her life, Richard, and got married shortly after his graduation. Upon moving to Midland, Sue enjoyed a successful career at Dow and raised a family of three boys. Sue and Rich shared a love of skiing and together volunteered as ski patrollers for 43 years at Snow Sink. She loved spending time at their cottage on Crystal Lake, traveling the world with her family and friends, but most of all having a house full of children and grandchildren. Sue enjoyed making jewelry with friends and serving at the Midland Open Door. Sue and Rich led high schoolers on on the Blessed Sacrament Youth Outreach Team for 15 years, serving those in need throughout the United States. Through these mission trips, Sue repaired homes and touched the lives of many, many youth with her ministry. She was a proud youper and a devoted wife, mother, grandmother, and sister. Sue will be lovingly remembered, and among others, by her husband of 39 years, Richard, and by her children, Phil, Matthew, and Stephen. Phil, on behalf of the board and the entire Midland Public School family, please accept our condolences. We are so very sorry for your loss. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Item 8.3 is following a staff member announced retirement, effective as of this date. Cynthia Roberts is a teacher currently at Dow High School. Her retirement will become effective at the end of this month, October 30th, 2020. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank uh, Ms. Roberts for her service. Uh, next up is item 9, correspondence to and from the board. Uh, we just have 9.1 uh, for information, uh, letters from the uh, individuals and entities listed in 9.1. Uh, next up, we have a under 9.2, a FOIA request from the Mackinac Center. Uh, following that on the agenda is item 10, uh, activities, a list of the next regularly scheduled Board of Education meetings uh, running through June 21st of 2021. And finally, we are at the study discussion session. Uh, in this, are there any points of clarification that anybody would like to discuss tonight before we turn it over to Mike? If anyone's going to sign up for the MASB conference, they need to do that through Megan, I believe. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Scott, in today's... Uh, uh, Superintendent Communique, um, there is going to be, um, what is it going to be? We're going to have a um, 
opportunity for people to vote or to express their opinion if they want to continue face-to-face -face or they want to continue with the hybrid? Opportunity to select. To select, okay. I um, wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and, and what we're trying to achieve with that. And then the second part of it is, would you consider uh, having it be a little bit longer than a week? Um, I know just myself being a, a contractor in the construction world that uh, there's not a lot of contractor and construction people available on the 16th to the 23rd because that's kind of a Michigan holiday during that time. So there might not be uh, some moms and dads around to have that conversation of during that time. For So I so wondered if you would entertain to have that open for maybe a two-week period. We could. We could. Um, we want the drop-down date of the 26th. We okay. can open it the week, week before. But we're giving notice each week, so it'll be out each week prior to the window being open. So they actually have three or four weeks to, to decide if in that week they're going to make their selection. And all we are accomplishing is what we promised them to do. We told them they had a semester-long commitment to virtual. So we know some want back from virtual at this point to face-to-face. -face. And so this is just the window that allows the present virtual parents to decide go, to go back to face-to-face. -to -face. But they're aware of that now, so it's no surprise. So it's in the communique today, but, and I believe that's three weeks until the window's open um, that we're going to, to do it. That was our plan. So technically, Brad, they kind of have three or four weeks mm -hmm. um, to choose in there. But we could open the, the date a little earlier if you're thinking... Uh, that some of us may be heading to the woods, right? But, I mean, certainly it, it, our parents know this is coming. We've told them it's coming. Um, it's just simply uh, we told them that, that they were choosing virtual for at least a semester. Yep. Um, and many of them at this point have, I, I think, made their mind up that virtual wasn't what they wanted it to be and would like to be face, back face-to-face. -face. And so we need to know that early because it will involve Agreed. with staffing and movement back. Uh, there, there's a lot behind the scene. As you know, we raced in the beginning of the year the other way as the numbers grew and got large enough from hiring, and, and that made it look clunky to start the year. And so we're trying to get ahead of that for the second semester. We're also going to explore Wednesday with our administrators the option for our elementary parents um, for their semester to end with the Christmas holiday, and they could go back after and start on the, after the first year into the face-to-face -face if they wish. It doesn't work as easy at the secondary level, but it does it's at the elementary level. They're not semester-driven, exam-driven at the end of each semester, and it's kind of nice to have that transition during the holiday break back. And mm -hmm. so as after Wednesday, when we kind of allow our building administrators to give us feedback, we, we may be announcing the elementary level once you choose. We'll be moving back um, on January 3, I believe. Is it 2 or 3? That okay. makes sense. Yep. The only other question that I had is uh, last month I had uh, requested that we have a formal update from Barton Mallow, and I don't know if you're going to talk about that in, in, in your portion of it or if that's something that's in the works. They're scheduled for November the November board meeting. Okay. So we need to go back, but of course they need to get themselves prepped to do sure. so. Thanks. Mike, the floor is yours for whatever else you have. Um, we mentioned performance contractor earlier in the, I believe, the FFO minutes, and that bid is released probably as of this afternoon, Brian, if I'm not misspeaking. Yes, so this afternoon it went out on the bid sites uh, for that piece of that, and then we will, uh, you know, our plan is to review that FFO and bring a recommendation back to you. As you well know, we've been working with one of the firms, which is kind of normal how you do that, and they had to get a little insight because they've written some of this to help assist us. We reviewed this RFP with our legal consultant as well as our financial consultant multiple times before we put it out. Um, bond work, I gave you a list of the number of projects that will be going out to bid is we want to get to the market earlier, early as possible, and we want to get the right jobs in the market early that could be the most complicated. And one is the bleacher replacement at the stadium. With that hill is going to pose a little bit of an issue to be careful with the press box, the new track, the turf that's down there. And so we want to get that one out to bid. 
if you recall, the reason we're bidding that is we shorted it up for a while, but the, the, the foundation's gone, and so that foundation has to come out of that side of it. And we're, doing, we're able to do that with our um, contingency savings and our interest, so that's an additional project that we've added, like many others, um, through this. Um, there's several other projects listed there for you from front of classroom um, technology into the classrooms, some flooring, um, those type of projects throughout the district as well. COVID-19 and where we stand today, um, you know, we saw a pretty good jump in numbers over the last two weeks as a country, a state, and certainly our school district. Um, I don't want people to misrepresent that number, though. It's always scary anywhere, but um, we only had one event in school that caused um, some spreading, and we had only two events ever of a positive person in the building. The rest were close contacts to some of those students. And then a lot of the close contacts have occurred in their own homes, and they've been quarantined out in their homes. So we got as high as in the 90s. Tomorrow, I think it'll drop into the low 70s. We have several of them cleared um, going out there. But certainly, uh, we need to stay to our protocols. It's a little more relevant in our county, in our community, and we have to continue to be careful. But if you really look at the numbers, um, we've had only one event where we've been responsible for a spread, and we contain that, and we quarantine a whole area and had no, no further developed. So the protocols in the schools so far, or the pooling of the kids somehow in the school, has been a positive. Now, if we get all of us adults to model the kids' behavior, we might have <laughs> more success. So that's part of the issue. I think um, people are realizing is we might be just out there socializing a little more in larger groups than we should. We have some concern about Friday night. As you know, that event will still be limited seating, but uh, certainly we don't want to get too relaxed and everyone think it's back to normal. Uh, Midland High Dow Week. It is not, and we need to keep um, our practices up out there. You know, really, when you talk about banning some of those things, we're really looking at a six by six area, not a six foot area, six by six area, front and back, even in open air. And so we're going to really follow some of the protocols in order to be safe. We are not probably going to recommend that we look at lifting other options going into the winter at this point with trends going up. Don't, don't expect us to um, prove vocal music inside the building and some of those things. Uh, we, we delayed those decisions as much as possible, uh, but the recommendations for most health officials is that's not safe at this point, and certainly with the numbers growing. You know, I just heard before we came to the board meeting tonight, some positive that that vaccine's probably gonna make it to the hospital workers in December. And the negative is they're saying we're in for probably our worst two or three months through, through this COVID. And we have to be remindful, our number one mission is to have those kids in school so we can teach them face to face. So some of the other activities we know that add to the educational environment may have to sacrifice for a while to try to at least do the, the highest priority. That's all I have. Okay, thanks Mike. Um, before we wrap it up, I just, for those of us, uh, for those of you who are still with us on, on Zoom and for those who may be watching, um, thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate your time. Have a safe Halloween. And remember, when you vote, don't forget about the nonpartisan side of the ticket. Thanks. Be safe, everybody. Thank May you. I, let, let's get a motion oh. to adjourn. So moved. Support. Support. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thanks, everyone.